this video tutorial, Dr. Robert Hasurgian, professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and pathologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital, discusses his approach to workup of a bone marrow biopsy in a patient with refractory anemia. Dr. Hasurgian is director of the Hematopathology Fellowship Program at MGA and is a member of the Pathology Advisory Committee for the World Health Organization Classification of Myeloid Neoplasms. And today I'll be going over with you a bone marrow biopsy and my approach to it in a patient who presented with a history of anemia. This is an 84-year-old man who presented with anemia and fatigue. He had a normal white blood count and an overall normal differential, although there was one nucleated red blood cell noted. His hemoglobin was 7.3 and he was mildly microcytic with an MCB of 76.9. Platelets were normal. And the hematologist actually uh, thought the patient might have thalassemia and was a little bit cheapish uh, when he uh, came with me to review the bone marrow thinking maybe it wasn't necessary because the patient uh, presumably possibly had a history of thalassemia. So uh, I'd like to now go over with you some of the slides, um, including the peripheral smear, which I consider to be an essential component whenever we're reviewing a bone marrow. We should look at the peripheral smear, as well as the bone marrow aspirate smear and bone marrow biopsy. So here's the patient's peripheral smear seen at 40x magnification. You can see that uh, there's uh, quite a bit of anisopoikilocytosis of red cells, including target cells, as well as some elliptocytes and a lot of variation in cell size. Um, this neutrophil appears to have normal granulation. And looking around in other fields, again, you can see teardrop forms, elliptocytes, and target cells. Platelets appear to be normal in number. Under oil, we can further see the red cell uh, abnormal morphology. Here's a large granular lymphocyte. And what I'm going to do is just look to see neutrophils to see about um, what they look like in terms of their granulation with the possibility of MDS having hypogranular neutrophils. I also point, like to point out some basophilic stippling in this red cell. So here's a normal appearing monocyte and a normally granulated neutrophil. And on careful review of the smear, um, I thought the neutrophils looked normally granulated and did not see any blast forms. This is a low power view of the bone marrow aspirate. And you can see it's quite excellent. Uh, there are many spicules and cellular elements in the trails and many good areas that we can look at. It's important to screen the aspirate at low power. This is, for example, 10x to look at the number and distribution of megakaryocytes, the overall quality. Here, megakaryocytes appear to have normal nuclear lobation, and these two megakaryocytes also look normal. This is a view of the aspirate smear under oil magnification, and you can see that it appears to be a preponderance of erythroid elements, or a reversed myeloid erythroid ratio. You can see erythroids of all stages, including early forms. And there are definitely some nuclear irregularities in the erythroids, as shown here. In this field as well, we see a number of erythroid elements that are maturing normally, and the myeloid series appears to show normal granulation. Again, here we see a binucleated erythroid cell. And I'll just show you one more field under oil to illustrate the abundance of erythroids, including forms with nuclear irregularities, like a notch there. That one is irregular as well, and this one has an elongated nucleus. Here's a low-power image of the bone marrow biopsy. You can see it is somewhat hemorrhagic and it doesn't have a huge amount of material to look at, but we do have areas of intact marrow where we can get a sense of the cellularity in areas of non-disrupted marrow. And the cellularity in this case is about 60%, which is higher than expected for the patient's age. So this is a hypercellular marrow. And looking on higher power, you can see there is a preponderance of erythroid elements, as we also saw in the aspirate smear. You can see here a cluster of erythroids, another cluster down here. In this area, again, you can see early and as well as more mature erythroids, as well as some maturing myeloid elements here. It's important to also look at the megakaryocytes in the biopsy specimen. Here the megakaryocytes appear to show normal lobation. And again, looking around, the megakaryocytes that I see here appear to show a normal spectrum of morphology. Other important items to note is absence of lymphoid aggregates and uh, myeloids appear to be maturing with no evidence of increased blasts, at least on routine morphology. This is an image of the GIMP sustain. Uh, at MGH, we routinely do GIMP sustains on the biopsy of all bone marrow cases, um, and we think this is helpful in illustrating uh, early erythroids. You can see here the basophilic cytoplasm is brought out nicely by the GIMSA. Also, the irregular nucleoli, typical of erythroid elements, early erythroids is shown here, 
or the multiple small sort of delicate nuclei shown here in this cluster of early erythroids. And this is reassuring, suggesting these are not myeloblasts, but are actually early erythroids, which is also suggested by the surrounding later erythroid elements uh, together with the early forms. And again, you can see eosinophils brought up by the GIMSA and maturing myeloid element. So just to summarize the morphology results, uh, we saw some red cell anisopoikolocytosis in the peripheral smear. Uh, in the bone marrow, we saw evidence of dyserythropoiesis, although mild, probably more than 10% of erythroid elements um, in the bone marrow aspirate smear. Um, and the bone marrow biopsy seemed to show normal megakaryocytes and no abnormal infiltrates. Additional important information, uh, flow cytometry was done in this bone marrow specimen. There was no increase in myeloid blasts and no phenotypic aberrancies and no abnormality of lymphoid cells. Now, one might question whether it's necessary to perform any immunochemistry in our bone marrows. Um, we routinely perform GIMS and reticulin stains. I didn't show you the reticulin stain, but it showed no increase. It was grade zero reticulin. We don't routinely do any immunostains on bone marrow. I think if you have a good aspirate and reliable, uh, good flow cytometry, um, I don't think it's necessary. In this case, it might not be uh, unreasonable to do a CD34 to look for increased blasts, but because there were no, no evidence of increased blasts in the excellent aspirate smear we had and no increase in blasts by flow cytometry, I felt comfortable uh, not necessarily doing a CD34 in the bone marrow biopsy. So I didn't order any in stains in this case. Similarly, there are no lymphoid aggregates to uh, look for, and flow cytometry suggested no abnormal lymphoid population. I do think it is critical to do an, to do an iron stain in every bone marrow done for anemia to look for ring sideroblasts, and this should be done on the aspirate smear because iron leaches out in the biopsy, um, and so it's not very sensitive. So let's take a look at the iron stain that was done on this case. So here's a high power view of a spicule on the iron stain, which was excellent, uh, similar to the bone marrow aspirate right game sustain. I like to look first in the spicules because you can see the presence of storage iron here. This right away excludes the possibility of iron deficiency, which you might have considered given the patient uh, has microcytosis. However, it also shows uh, the presence of what appear to be ring sideroblasts here. Now, this is not the best place to look for ring sideroblasts. We should go out on the trails, but um, when there are so many erythroids together in the, in the um, spicule, it often gives you an initial sense of, of what things might, uh, might be there, like ring sideroblasts. So here we're out in a thinner area of the iron stain smear, and uh, ring sideroblasts are quite difficult to visualize. You have to be on oil, and you have to focus up and down. But this cell here is an erythroid, and you can see when I focus up and down, there are some siderotic granules surrounding the nucleus. Um, so this is, in fact, a ring sideroblast. However, there are many erythroids in the other uh, parts of the, this field that do not show um, ring sideroblasts. Here we are in another part of the smear, and again, you can see another ring sideroblast here, as well as here. Uh, there's only partial ring, but that's enough to call a ring sideroblast around this erythroid. Um, and all in all, uh, there were about 10% ring sideroblasts among the erythroid elements. So to summarize the results of the um, morphology in the iron stain, we have the presence of 10% ring sideroblasts in addition to erythroid dysplasia, which brings up the possibility of a myelodysplastic syndrome. Now what about the patient's microcytosis? And I mentioned the clinician suspected the possibility of thalassemia. Well, the patient had normal iron studies, but when we looked at the clinical record, the patient had had a hemoglobin electrophoresis back in 2013. This was repeated in 2018, and both showed the same results. A low hemoglobin A, elevated hemoglobin A2, and an elevated hemoglobin F, which are consistent on the electrophoresis studies with beta thalassemia minor. The question is, is the, uh, are the morphology findings we see in the bone marrow consistent with that? So um, we have to step back here and think um, about the possibility of morphologic changes in beta thalassemia. Turns out you can get significant erythroid dysplasia in thalassemia, or for example in hemolysis, as a so-called stress erythropoiesis. But what about the ring sideroblasts? Well, it turns out there are actually reports of ring sideroblasts that can occur in patients with beta thalassemia that don't represent a clonal uh, MDS with ring sideroblasts. So this casts some doubt into whether the significance of the ring sideroblasts in this setting, and also they were only 10% of erythroid cells, which doesn't allow a primary diagnosis of MDS with ring sideroblasts in the WHO criteria. So I signed out this case uh, based on this information as suspicious for myelodysplastic syndrome based on the erythroid dysplasia and ring sideroblasts, which although reported are quite rare in thalassemia. And um, 
the missing information here that we need to have to complete the picture is the set of genetics and the molecular genetic studies. We actually do send, I think set of genetics is critical to send on every MDS case or possible MDS case. Molecular genetic sequencing is not required, but I think it can be very helpful uh, to combine with other features, and as you'll see, it was very helpful in this case. So after I signed up the case, uh, about two weeks later, we got the results of the karyotype and the molecular genetics, and those are shown here. So the set of genetics has showed a deletion 20Q, which in and of itself is not sufficient to diagnose MDS, but given that it was present in 18 of 20 metaphases, it was very strong evidence that this was a clonal process. And then the um, snapshot panel that we perform in MGH, which looks for mutations in 54 myelin-associated genes, found only one mutated gene, but it was a pathogenic mutation. It was an SF3B1 present at a variant allele fraction of 8.2%. This, uh, this mutation was a very important finding because it, together with the ring sitter blasts, suggested this truly was an MDS. Um, because in those reported cases I mentioned earlier, beta thalassemia with ring sitter blasts, there were no mutations. So uh, based on this, these genetic findings, I believe the ring cytoblast did indicate clonal hematopoiesis, and the erythroid dysplasia was reflective of an, of an MDS. The patient, however, also has beta thalassemia. So in this case, I'm postulating this is actually an MDS superimposed on the patient's baseline beta thalassemia. And I think looking into clinical record uh, really supported this contention. You can see here we have actually... Um, MCV and hemoglobin levels going back to 2013 in this patient. She uh, had a typical hemoglobin level of about 10 in prior years and an MCV in the high 60s. But then around 2017, she had some cardiac surgery here. But around that time, her MCV began to elevate and her hemoglobin began to decrease. I think this represents the, um, the acquisition of a clonal hematopoiesis state. Um, diagnostic of MDS with the ring sideroblasts on the bone marrow biopsy performed in 2018. And you can see here that although her MCV was still low, it was higher than her baseline, indicating the presence of a high MCV state uh, by, uh, due to the MDS. So this change in her status, I think, supported the morphology of ring sideroblasts, sf 3 b one mutation, and erythroid dysplasia, indicating that she's now developed a myelodysplastic syndrome. So my final diagnosis in this case was a descriptive, initially mildly hypercellular, moderately hypercellular marrow with erythroid predominance, ring sitter blasts, and SF3B1 mutation, which together confirmed a diagnosis of MDS with ring sitter blasts and single lineage or erythroid lineage dysplasia. And this was superimposed on a diagnosis of beta thalassemia minor. So I think this case illustrates the difficulties of diagnosing MDS in a patient with comorbid conditions, in this case a patient with beta thalassemia minor, and shows how using genetic data can really supplement your morphologic interpretation in arriving at, uh, um, at, at the correct diagnosis.